Now, he defends John in case anyone wanted to criticize him. Verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. And by the way, he wasn't a reed shaken with the wind. He was a wind shaking the reeds. The pulpit today has become very weak because it will not speak out and tell the truth always. There's the danger today of the pulpit being subject to somebody sitting out there in the pew that doesn't like the preacher or the message tailored to suit a certain group in a church. The message should be given out regardless, and the pulpit should be a wind-shaking reeds then. Too often it's the reed that's shaken by the wind, by the way. And that's not as it should be. John the Baptist, thank God for him. He was a wind-shaking reed, and he wasn't a reed shaken by the wind. And our Lord continues, verse 8, But what went ye out for to see, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. John the Baptist was rugged and He was a rugged individual. Verse 9, What went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Now, he was a prophet, but he's more than that. The superiority of John actually over the Old Testament prophets is amazing here. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Our Lord declares clearly that he came to fulfill Malachi, the third chapter, verse 1, that he was the messenger. Now he goes on, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. He's the greatest of any in the past. Now we sometimes today debate the question of who was greater, Moses or Abraham. And then there are others that like to put David in the list. Well, the Lord Jesus said there'd been none greater than John the Baptist. And I'm sure our Lord would have put Abraham and Moses and David, since he mentioned them so many times, none of them topped John the Baptist. But now notice what he says, "...notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he." So that when you come to this period after our Lord came into the world and this group he's calling out of the world today, the least. Why? Because he's in Christ, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Now, verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by storm. This has been a difficult verse. This force here can be either internal or external. And it's made it difficult to interpret this verse. The forces of evil from without seek to destroy it. That's true. But also only those who are committed wholeheartedly press into it. That is, they violently want to come in. You see, there is the note of need and desperation. We've already seen that one young man ran and fell at his feet and says, Master, I'll follow you whithersoever thou goest. You see, you have these two aspects. I'm not quite clear in my thinking what our Lord meant. I rather think he meant both. He was referring to both of these. Now let me read on at verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. You see, John is a prophet. And if ye will receive it, this is Elijah which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what is it you're to hear? Well, the Spirit of God, I think, would make this clear to us. And will you listen to me very carefully here? The fact of the matter is that John the Baptist fulfilled the messenger that was to come in Malachi 3.1. But the question arises, if they had accepted Christ at that time, it had been promised that Elijah would come. All right, what about that? Our Lord said that this... If ye will receive it, that is, receive him. This is Elijah, which was for to come. I know somebody's going to say to me, well, that means he would establish the kingdom immediately 
then that would mean that John the Baptist would have been Elijah. That's it exactly. Somebody then says, well, how can that be? And I have an answer for you. I don't know. I just know that's what Jesus said. And do you know that he can do things that I can't explain? And there are a lot of things God has done, is doing, going to do. I can't explain them, but God says he's going to do them. And I go along with the Lord on this. That This would have been true. In other words, this keeps this argument down today. There are those that say, well, it wasn't a sincere offer of the kingdom if he came and intended to go to the cross and die. Oh, yes, it was. Somebody says, well, if they had accepted him. Well, the interesting thing is they didn't. And these iffy questions are no good anyway. People say, if Adam and Eve had not have sinned, what would it have been? I don't know, because they sinned, friends. That's an if question. And these iffy questions are no good, and they pose problems that don't exist. And there are enough problems that do exist without making up some. Now, will you notice, he goes on to say here, verse 16, "...but whereunto shall I liken this generation?" And this is one of the parables he gave that is loaded, my friend, with biting sarcasm and irony, not to hurt or harm, but to illustrate a great truth. He says, whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's likened unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we've piped unto you and you've not danced, we've mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. The picture is this, a group of children out playing in the street. And one group says, let's play funeral. They play funeral and they say, no, we don't like that. Let's play wedding. They play wedding and then they say, we don't like that. One extreme to the other. They're spoiled children. That generation was like that. And we have them like that today. Now, will you notice what is said here? For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath a demon. John came. He's austere. My, I tell you, John was very severe. And he was out there in the wilderness fasting. Now the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold a man gluttonous and a wine bib, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. That is... There were those that said, oh, John is too austere. Well, Jesus is friendly. What about him? Oh, he's gluttonous. There are some people in the church, friend, I've learned a long time ago, you can't please them, and you're better off if you forget about them because nothing will please them. They don't like this preacher because he's quite dry. He just stands up there and in a monotone gives his sermon, and it's too deep, and they don't understand it. And then here comes along another one. He pounds the pulpit, and he has a great time, and he's very simple. And they said, we don't like him either. There are a lot of people you'll never please them, friends, at all. And 